Okay, so today I'm going to go quickly over step eight, what to look for as you prepare your report. And at this point, you have the directions for the report in hand. And those of you online, you can access that on the homepage of the course. And so when you're looking at chapters four through eight, obviously some of this you've considered before you carried out your assessment. And as you went through the assessment, you gathered information. Now as you uh, assess the findings and make recommendations, you need to consider each one of these aspects that we've talked about so far, starting with the um, need to go back and make sure I have my correct term, but the assessment, the environmental analysis, and then each one of these other aspects since then, most recently looking at organizational capacity, but looking at leadership is also important. When your book talks about leadership, I think it's not quite as clear what they're talking about, but if I said, where is the leadership of your organization, what would you identify, Willie? Where's the leadership of my organization? Yeah. The coaching staff. The coaching well, staff, okay. Because you're looking at the wrestling team. I would say at first the coaching staff, but um, as a coaching staff, you always are you know, dive and understand. The coaching staff always looks for guys, leaders within the team. You know, right. Obviously, the teammates are going to be closer than with the coaching yes. staff. Okay, and I'm really aware of it with football because football has so many yeah, players yeah. that you have the coaching staff, most specifically the head coach. Those of you who are looking explicitly at nonprofits need to consider the board of directors. They're the bosses. So even so, if you're looking at, a, at the wrestling, if you're looking at the team, you're also looking at who the co head coach reports to, right? Yep. So you wouldn't want to forget Christian. No, I yeah. Now. Yes. So when we look at the leadership, we're going to include Christian. If you're going to look at the leadership, you're going to look at everybody's going to look at their board of directors, their executive director, and then the equivalent to the coaching staff, the other coaches, you've got the directors of each program too. Those are the most important people to include as you assess the leadership. And I am trusting that you've already pretty much been in touch with those folks, right? So at this step, this is what you need to consider in your analysis and also as you finish up, if you wanted to, you know, my experience is, especially in, your, in a learning situation, you might find, oh, I really should have gotten the perspective of so-and-so, and you might go back and, um, and double check to make sure you're on, on the right page, you know, with someone to just sort of follow up. Um, I think I was talking to Diamond on Wednesday and he was saying, well, you know, I tried to ask questions I needed to ask. I probably forgot some. Well, that's part of the learning process. The more you do interviews, the more you do analyses, the more you do surveys, the more you'll learn to hone your questions. You've got guidelines to go by, but say, oh yeah, you know, I read the guidelines, but I didn't realize this is really what was meant by those guidelines. So you learn to hone the questions have no when to follow up for clarification and to get the information you need. So, okay, I'm going to step back a little bit and your book refers to leadership qualities and those of you who have taken the intro course prior to uh, this year will remember those t the qualities in the secondary book we would study as far as those, I forget what they call them, um, the Ten Truths About Leadership, I think. How many of you have studied that book? Modeling the Way, Leaders Should Model the Way, Inspire a Shared Vision, Challenge the Process, Enable Others to Act, and Encourage the Heart. In one, in a broad sweep way, you're sort of looking to see as it relates to your problem, your research question, 
how is that how is that reflected in the leadership qualities you don't and you want to look for strengths because in one sense in a very real sense you are doing this study for the leaders themselves so if you see areas of improvement you want to couch it in a way that is also remember you're a leader too also encouraging supportive but also realistic so effective leaders are honest forward-looking inspiring competent and as you find those qualities bring them out in your assessment and the you're going to be reporting to the leaders as you find those qualities say this is what we're finding you have these qualities that will the strengths to build on as we move forward with this project so you're going to summarize the implications as it relates to vision mission values and you're going to be looking for the degree to which these foundational sets of ideas are understood and applied by your leadership remember we talked about as you talk to your board as you talk to others can they tell you what the mission is well, many can't. I've been asked that as a board member. I've been asked that um, in, uh, I, in a director's position. I usually could answer it, but I've been asked that in leadership capacities where I probably should have been able to, and I knew the gist of the mission, but I couldn't cite it. And I really think that if a person knows the gist and but can't be cited, yeah, yeah how well does it really reflect that mission the values the vision how well is it understood how well and how clear and widely understood are the strategic priorities that you've asked about that you've learned about in your agency as it relates to your specific focus um, and sorry for the title how consistently does the organization achieve, achieve its targeted goals so you're looking over that and if you've been looking at that and your uh, organization that you're working with has ideas have, sometimes this happens they have a lot of ideas they have good ideas and they may be making steps to try to achieve those ideas but from year to year there's no clear progress maybe because it's not focused enough maybe because they are so overwhelmed and underpaid and, un and under you know they have changes of staff and, and so many uh, responsibilities but not enough staff to carry it out that they have trouble getting back and focusing on it uh, you know how well is this happening again build on the strengths and if you are finding that they have great ideas they've had great ideas over the years and they may be a little bit too big one of the recommendations you can build into as you uh, respond to the problem statement you have is is that they take it in smaller steps and then also that they build in concrete ways to evaluate those steps on a regular basis so that one is smaller so that they can see real real um, progress each small step at a time but also build in the evaluation so that they are keeping it in the fore if it is really a high priority for them and then they don't feel frustrated because you know they feel frustrated if they have big ideas and they keep striving to sort of reach for them but they don't they don't see real progress so you know encouraging ways to help them get where they want to go board leadership and governance so you're looking at dimensions of effectiveness look at effectiveness of the key positions of the executive director and key staff and with staff development is there staff development is there an organizational culture that lends itself to the growth you're talking about is there succession planning going on most of you don't have to worry about succession planning at this with your focus but consider if it is a um, an issue and as they do so look at the level of intentionality what does that mean what does that mean to you 
level of intentionality. That's not a word we use all the time. Yeah. It is a cobbled together word coming from the word intention. And so what does intentionality imply? Diamond? Yeah, yeah. It's a focus, but it's also, uh, you know, is it just words that they spout out? Or is it reflected in, uh, as they take action, in the consciousness of other actions taken? To what degree do they really intend to carry out or develop the staff to, inc to have that healthy organizational culture, to have succession planning it's taken in within that context. Is it just, you know, are those items just ignored? And that's where in talking to, um, in, in talking to Scott, and he's frustrated because he doesn't see a lot of it, that focus on staff development on the organizational culture. Now, as he is carrying out his project and working otherwise, he does see, actually, he, he has confided in me that actually uh, the director wants to know and does care and is open to being more intentional, which is a really good sign. And so the level of intentionality is one thing, and then organized action in those uh, those areas is another sometimes you may have the intention and it's in your consciousness but the other environmental factors don't allow you to take action so you're looking for opportunity to take action is there evidence by action that uh, all of this is taking place you're also looking for diversity and cultural competency. This is often overlooked in organizations that don't have a lot of diversity. And it's only, I have noticed in recent years, that people in, in this environment will really make a conscious effort to say, OK, where is the diversity? Well, we don't have it. Remember when I was in a previous life, previous job, where among other things, I was responsible for receiving requests for disability support at a college. And, uh, and when I approached the administration and said, we need to build in a better support system for our disabled students, they said, we don't have enough disabled students to be concerned about that. My response was, you don't have the disabled students because it is not an environment that they can, that they, where their needs are being met. And being a public supported institution receiving federal funding, we have a legal obligation here. And it took a little bit of convincing, actually it took taking micro steps, and with each micro step, step the community of advocates for people with disabilities that picked up on it and actually within a year we had tripled the number of students with special needs and that was just moving an inch along so I was able to go back and say you know we've, we've done just a little bit we've identified all these needs we've done just a little bit to see the results see how much more we can do. And luckily it was also at a time where the computers were becoming available where making print, having access to large print, having access to uh, easy access to recordings uh, was becoming more and more possible. Mobility issues were being addressed, uh, making uh, facilities easier for people with mobility issues, but not in the where. When you're doing an assessment, I'm asking you and keep in mind to consider that. How does diversity and cultural competency relate to your proposed 
change? I would say that in most of the cases it relates. Doesn't it relate, John? Yeah, you're saying yes, because you want to reach out to the whole population, not just those who are already somewhat fit and wanting to be more fit. You want to reach the whole population. And your, in your case, Leah, your whole project is all about cultural competency. So uh, diversity, cultural competency is an, uh, an issue. External communications. Be thinking about, and this relates to every one of you, how well does your agency reach out and communicate to the broader public, to its stakeholders, but also the broader public, what it is that they do, what it is that, where it is that they need feedback, but also uh, to create an environment where when you're asking the uh, the public to be involved, take advantage of the services, that all of this has taken place, how, how well does your agency com communicate with the public and also get the public involved? So that might have to do with public relations, but it may also have to do with strengthening your uh, external stakeholder base. Fundraising and planning for sustainability. I'm not going to insist on that with your small project that you do it, but do consider it unless the fundraising and sustainability is the core of your study. Okay. Planning for sustainability is an increasingly important issue that people in planning and development are becoming more and more uh, advocates of as grant funders and other funding sources are looking to say, um, not only are we going to look at your current infrastructure for its ability to carry out the project you propose, we are definitely looking for specific signs of your ability to continue your services even once the grant funds are are no longer there, even if changes occur, even if, you know, how deep is your uh, administrative system? If you have one director and something happens to that director, what happens to your project and your program? And that is something that I would guess that Leah has to be concerned about, right? Yes. And I don't know that much about uh, the infrastructure of your program, John, but I would guess it's something you have to be concerned with. Too. So that's that. Any questions about what it is that you need to consider as far as leadership as you continue with your analysis? All right. So at this point, and for the folks online, I encourage you to take a look at the written assessment report directions that are available on the home page. And for the rest of you, you have copies in front of you. At this point, from this point forward, actually, I have just completed the last presentation for this class. And everything from here on out is focused on helping you write the report. Most of you, almost all of you, have completed your assessment so you're ready to begin. Is that right? right? If that is not correct, and if you're running into snags, please, please, please plan to meet with me immediately. And that's for those of you online as well as face-to-face. -face. We need to talk if your assessment is not complete. So, I mean, if your study part is not complete. At this point, then, I'm going to look at the report. And I've been talking about it. I'm hopeful. This was drafted. It's an, ad and it's an adjustment from what I have done before, uh, looking at what's in the book, looking at what traditionally a report would include. You are asked to include more steps, more background to your analysis than you would, in a, as I mentioned on Wednesday, in a regular re report that would go to the Board of Directors. Board of Directors don't always get bogged down with every step of your um, 
of your study, but for the purposes of my review and also to help with, uh, I'm assuming you're gonna be sharing this with the, uh, the executive director and with the other key personnel, they probably want to know too, uh, so that the section on uh, sharing your methods and your findings are gonna be more detailed than they would be for uh, a report that would be made for publication. However, uh, so in that sense, I'm following the outlines of a research report where you do have to include all of that information. But uh, once we get past the findings sections to the analysis, you're going back into the mode of what you would propose and what you do propose to the agency as far as changes. And so you're, you're essentially giving background. The, uh, after the title page, the first uh, section is background, where you introduce the topic, you introduce the issue, the problem, you're introducing the agency as well, and explain the process by which you came to your problem statement or research question, whichever you prefer to call it. From that, you can draw on the first, there are two, two, uh, two sources for you to draw on that you've already drafted. One is that first proposal that you wrote for me that explained what your project was going to be. You can go back to that and see how much of that you can just put in to the background statement. Also, for the IRB report, I had you go back and refine it and flesh it out a little bit more. You have that statement you drafted as well. So those are uh, sources of information that you can use. Also, as you, as you look at this, so the background information is going to be fairly well detailed. Go also to the worksheets, worksheets from chapters one, two, and three. So they give you, give us the information that you uh, originally found when you sort of took an overview, a look at your agency before you really got started on your study. You may find, because by the time you got to chapter three, you were into your study, you were pulling more information, you may find that some of that information you want to put into findings but if it was just the initial overview of what you're finding out about the agency and you're describing the agency, you're describing the process by which your problem statement was identified, then incorporate it there. It is intended that every worksheet that you have worked on and turned in has information that, was, that will help you write an excellent report. Once you have described the situation, described the agency and the process by which you came to the problem statement, then your actual final statement in your background should be what the problem is or what the question, your research question is. It will be the focus of what your study is. Does that make sense? How many of you have already started drafting that background statement? You have? Okay. Have you run into any snacks? they'll keep coming out even after you finish your report. That's normal too. So as you get additional information, is that part of your gathering the facts? Is that will that go into your findings section? Will that be a part built into the process of continuing to get information after the fact be built into your methodology? Or is it just background information you didn't know before but now you know it now and you need to consider it? In which case, 
uh, decide at what point you introduce it. If it's appropriate to fit it into the background information, do so. If it makes more sense because it came after you did your study and it, it didn't influence the study but it's influencing your recommendations, then I would put that actually in the findings. Yeah. Yes? Okay. Okay. So you found out more information from a different source that caused you to go back and get a little bit more clarity so you were better informed. And I would guess some of that will go into your background information. So, but if, for instance, um, your actual questions and study would have been totally different had you known, then I, that's when I would say as you, um, as you uh, reference your findings and also analysis of the findings that you incorporate at that point, and also you would build that in as part of an explanation in your conclusion. If you look at, at the very last section, well, not the very last written section is your conclusion section, where you will once more restate the problem, research questions and references, because by this time you've already uh, detailed a plan of action, but to take into, sound limit, in, into consideration limitations. You may have a plan of action, but part of that, you might say, in order to implement this plan of action, this, infra this infrastructure needs to be developed, needs to be more fully developed, needs to be strengthened. Um, limitations of the study, if you interviewed 10 people, but you didn't get a representative sample, you might say before this plan of action is finalized, we need to get more input for more stakeholders, that kind of thing. So, I've jumped ahead to the last ones. The sections you have, besides the title page, is background information. And yes, it will be detailed as you go back through your the sheets you prepared. And it shouldn't be as overwhelming as it would have been had you not done those worksheets. I hope you find that true. Uh, and then methodology section is where you simply explain the process by which you gather data. And it's not just your study, it's the background information as well. So for instance, uh, really I'm going to assume that you had formal questions, but also you had informal discussions with the players and that. You would say, as a part of gathering information, and you would uh, mention the, the informal just discussions that took place, the any documents that you looked at, uh, and present it, when you do the methodology uh, section, you are just explaining what you did. You're not presenting your findings. You're just explaining the process. And you don't include the questionnaire with that part? Because it says... Uh, with the methodology section, you would uh, say that you had prepared a questionnaire. You could even explain what it focused on. If you have, and yours is a brief one, you can actually put those questions maybe in an inset box, but if it's longer, and for some of you it's much longer, uh, you can uh, keep a copy, put a copy of your questionnaire or your survey instrument in the um, attachments at the end, make reference to it in the section. Yeah. And then, the next section, once you've explained the steps you went through, then you, it's time to present what you found. So just as you went step by step, this is what I did. Okay. Now, technically with a report, you don't use the first person. So you might say this is what was done. Even in an agency report, you don't use the first person, I forgot to mention that before. Uh, but you could say this is what was done. These are the findings related to step by step. What you found out in each one, you don't have to go in as much detail. If there's a lot of detail, 
from anyone. For instance, if you had a survey instrument, and that's what you did, John, right? You, you actually had a survey instrument which was given to how many people? Okay, 10. And you might have a compile, a compilation of your findings. Now it's qualitative, not quantitative. You weren't asking yes and no questions. You were asking questions to get insights. So, but you might, uh, you might do an analysis of the nature of the responses and report it in your attachments. But in the findings section, that's where you give a summary of what you found for each of the methods by which you gathered information. The next section is where you start getting into the real sort. This is where uh, if you were doing a report for the board of director, directors, you would spend more time with the analysis of the findings than your method of gathering the findings. Does that make sense? The board of directors are not all that interested. Most of them, they want to know just very briefly what you did. But they, the methodology section and the findings section would, would be minimalized and the analysis of what you discovered would be more of what they're looking for. So what's the significance of what you discovered? That's what the analysis of finding is. Synthesizing, the word synthesizing means to be taking pieces from many different sources and weaving it together. It's like fabric that is synthesized fabric. It's a bit of this and a bit of that, but it's one piece of fabric. So you're weaving it together to show what you really found out from, uh, and your sources, that's where you're combining all of your sources to analyze the significance of what was discovered. And it's in the analysis of findings that it's at this point that if you have the luxury of being able to sit down with the people you've been working with and together do a SWOT analysis, that will make your report richer. If you're not able to, then do your best from your impressions. But the more you have key leadership involvement, key stakeholder involvement, the stronger your report will be. Also, from your SWOT analysis, consider, you know, from the SWOT analysis, you're going to come up with some recommendations of what you've discovered from that analysis. You'll know what the strengths are, you'll know what the, the weaknesses are, you'll know what the opportunities are out there and what the threats are, and from that, what are the key findings of taking your strengths and and moving on on that, what are you going to recommend? And then if you're able, consider doing a matrix map where you actually then uh, consider what impact each of those actions would have as well as um, how well it fits with the commission statement of your agency. And in that, you'd also consider you know, definitely the mission of your agency, but also how well it addresses the problem statement you've identified. From that, I'm assuming that you'll come up with just a couple of key points for action. Is that right? Okay. And that's for the next uh, section, your recommended action, you're going to be writing a plan of action. I'm assuming it'll be pretty simple, pretty straightforward. But at this point, you go back again. You'll find in most sections, you'll go back and keep that focus on your problem statement, but very definitely need to restate your problem statement in the action plan and state a purpose of the action you're going to propose. 
and then describe how that will take place. And actually, in words, write a picture of how you see that taking place. Step one, step two, and the results you would expect in each step. So write it as a narrative, but also, and if it will help you, first make a logic model, or as your book calls it, a theory of change model. You're probably not there yet, but this is just to go over and say, this is what you're going to be pulling together. So you don't want to wait until two more weeks before you get started on this. You want to be doing a step at a time. And um, because these up to this step, it's going to take a while to pull it all together. Your conclusion won't take long at all to write once you've done everything else. You're just going to and keep note of those things you want to bring awareness to uh, the limitations of your study, uh, any infrastructure changes that you need to be bolstered before the action you propose can take place, additional conversations that need to take place, additional stakeholders that need to be brought into the process. Because you're just doing an initial proposal that uh, perhaps is ready for action, but perhaps needs to be used as a discussion instrument before next steps can take place, right? Okay. So that will not take very long. And also, as you go through, you're taking note of what you want to put in your attachments or appendices. I'm going to call them attachments. Okay. And so they will be pretty much already ready for you. If you're able, by Monday, to have your background, a draft of your background information together, that's, where I'm, that's what I'm going to help you with. Or as you go through this, and it may, I'm hoping that because of the, uh, the attention you've already given your study, that this is pretty straightforward to you. But if you find it overwhelming, that's what I'm here for on Monday too. Any questions? This is helpful? Yes. Any? We, I will be here for anyone who would like help on class. Yes. So, key times, and I'm going to say it again because Willie wasn't here and I just told him, that, you know. <laughs> this is for Willie. Um, do come to class on Monday the 28th, Monday after Thanksgiving. Do come to class on Friday, December 9th. Every other class period, so that would be this coming Monday, Wednesday, Friday, after thanks, the week after Thanksgiving, and Monday, Wednesday, the following week. I am here to help each of you individually work on your report. I am also, I had meant to, didn't do it yet, uh, have, I'm opening a Dropbox for your drafts and use that as much as you would like. Uh, as you do so, I'm going to be checking hopefully almost daily or almost daily and try to get some feedback to you quickly. If it's problematic, meaning I've got to think about it before I really give you a response, it might take me two days to get back to you. But if it's quick, definitely I'll get back to you within the 24 hours. And except I'm not getting online on Thanksgiving Day, just think, okay? But um, but also call me if you have questions. Oh, and just I wanted to uh, also clarify, and it's in the directions I have on the home page. As you prepare a draft, do your best, but don't hold back. Don't don't hesitate to submit it because you know it's not the best. I'm talking to Leah now. Okay. Uh, go ahead and submit it and wait for my feedback. But what I do ask is that you read the feedback very carefully. You call me or email me if you're not quite sure what I mean by that, what I say, and follow my guidelines. Don't just do a part of it. It will also help me if you will highlight any changes that you've made from one draft to the next. So if it's a new section you're working on, don't worry about that. But if you've gone back and revised the section after it's given you feedback, then if you could highlight that so I know where to focus my attention, I can help you better. 
But if you just give me this, you know, see my comments, just pay attention to, and this happens frequently, I'll talk about content changes, which is the big stuff that has to do with what you say and how you say it. But I might mention a few grammatical usage things. Well, you can handle the usage things, so you make the usage correction and resubmit it without any content changes. That's when I will start paying less attention to what you're submitting because my focus is on paying attention to the content. Then the other things, the usage is easy, you know, that's easy stuff. So if you highlight the changes you've made and also pay attention, especially to the content uh, comments and let me know if you don't know what I mean, then I should be able to help you well. The difference in my being able to guide you through this process and give you feedback can make a huge, huge difference in the quality of your final presentation as those of you who've had me for other courses where I've taken drafts have, you've experienced that, haven't you? So, um, you know, it could make the difference between an A and a C, it could make the difference in extreme cases between an A and a D or an F. So do, uh, do get in touch with me and I will help you every step of the way. That's my goal for the next three weeks. I'm here to help you. Yeah, I drafted the first section. If you have more than the first section, fine, that's great. But to sort of set a goal of getting the pieces, and I, I think I mentioned on Wednesday, I called it an outline. So you're getting the pieces together of what you want to include. You might not even have it written in a narrative form. Whatever you have together, bring it in on Monday and come back. And then now, go ahead. Um, so were you expecting? I expect you to be able to focus on the first section by Monday. You'll keep writing as you go through. You see there are a number of sections here. So you want to keep writing and I will be there to help you with each section up through, up through Wednesday, December 7th. Uh, hopefully by then you've already submitted different sections. But that's when you're putting it together by December 7th. So, and so as I said, from this point forward, my job is to be your coach. Okay, there will be no grading of drafts. Okay, there will be coaching on the drafts. What will be graded is the final product, and the final product will weigh heavily between 50 and 60 percent of your final course grade. So, and my job is to help you write the very best. Any other questions? All right, Jack is here to take over the next class. Yeah. So, have.